Okay, um, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to get started with this workshop session. Um, as you all know, as we all know, uh, Scarborough has been engaged in moving to a brand new teacher evaluation system. Uh, the investigative work on the new models began two years ago and resulted in the selection of the Learning Sciences International Model, designed by the Marzano Center. We refer to it in-house as the Marzano Performance Evaluation Professional Growth Model. We abbreviate it, because we have to abbreviate everything in education, as the PEG, PEPG model. Uh, the work to date here in Scarborough represents the collective good thinking of school leaders, of faculty members, uh, and of board representatives. The Marzano Center is best known internationally for its expert research into best teaching practices with the goal of slip away on me, um, with the goal of employing best practices to build the capacity needed in teachers in teachers and in school leaders to successfully prepare all students to be college and career ready. Whether we agree or not, the US okay, uh, the U.S. education systems, particularly public K-12 systems, are criticized for perpetuating a model of teaching that runs about a mile wide and, a, and an inch deep. What we likely can agree on is the fact that the world is changing. What we recognize here in Scarborough and across the nation is that expectations about what our students need to be able to do are rapidly changing. So too, not surprisingly then, the way that we approach teaching and learning must change to keep pace with those changes in student expectations. The Marzano monograph that you all uh, received the last meeting, uh, the one entitled Teacher Observation Protocol for the 2014 Marzano Teacher Evaluation Model, was shared with the board not only because it provides uh, some great insight into this model that we're using, but I think, although perhaps unintentionally, it provides a window into the scope and complexity of how teaching and learning is changing. My team, the Leadership Council, the entire faculty, and the school board, and I, have been engaged in this transformative work for more than the last 40 months. I want to share with you the Leadership Council's analysis of the article that we all read, which you know, having read it, is informative, albeit dense and complex, difficult to get through. Common core and college and career readiness standards focus not only on what students are learning, which incidentally is not significantly different from what our mean learning results and the national content standards have focused us on since 1997. But on the extent to which students can, can apply what they learn, that's the change, that's the switch. Students need to demonstrate their knowledge not by simply feeding back what they've read or what their teacher has told them, but by solving novel and real life problems, by knowing what knowledge or skills to retrieve and apply through the use of thinking and analytical skills, applying logic, and backing up selected solutions with rationale and evidence for that selection. Maine adopted Common Core Standards for Math and English Language Arts in 2011. This is when the paradigm shift began statewide. These more focused and rigorous expectations for students required that classroom instruction be more focused and be more rigorous. And correspondingly, that raises what the expectations are of our teachers. I want to visit the four adaptations identified in the Marzano article and speak to the implications of these four really big changes for teaching the teachers. Research tells us that there are some high-powered, some high-impact teaching strategies that all teachers need to master, and they need to use them frequently in all of their classrooms, 
with all of their students in order to ensure that they're college and career ready. While there are 41 identified strategies and behaviors that teachers must master in this classroom domain, there are seven of these that are the power strategies. Teachers in every lesson need to develop in their students the skills and competencies to identify which content is most important, to elaborate on new content that students are learning, to record and represent what is being learned in a whole variety of ways, to attend to details in a way that allows making distinctions between and among characteristics, to reflect on the strength of their own reasoning and the reasoning of others, to continually update and revise what they think they're learning, and to engage in using their new knowledge to make predictions about complex new situations that may, that may, or that are, they're guaranteed to present uh, to these students. While most teachers will be familiar with these seven strategies that you're seeing up there on the board, and also many of the other 34 strategies that are in this domain of the model, the challenge is in developing a deep understanding of how to use each strategy most effectively, knowing when to use the strategy, and executing the right strategy at the right time seamlessly within the context of the lesson. The second adaptation, or big change in teaching, being driven by the change in expectations for students and how they will acquire and apply their learning, relates to shifts that impact planning and instruction shifts that will provide greater rigor and depth. English language arts and, and math instructional shifts compel all teachers, not just math and English language teachers, to make some fundamental adjustments in how they plan lessons and units of instruction and in their execution of those lessons. Literacy instruction is now considered a shared responsibility of history, science, technology, and other content area te teachers. So we're all in it together. English language art specific planning needs to incorporate student reading now that demonstrates a balance between literary texts and informational texts. Math planning needs to create a coherence in math learning, not just within one year, but across multiple years, so that students can achieve a deeper content understanding through the development and application of analytical competency. Teaching, the pedagogy piece is, is really just teaching. Pedagogy is the art of teaching. Further, English language art instruction needs to help students to support their opinions or positions using evidence. Students need to acquire the vocabulary that's necessary to understand complex ideas and then demonstrate an ability to convey their own ideas to others with clarity. In math, in math instruction, the field of topics needs to be narrowed and the depth of topics needs to be increased. As well, a balance needs to be struck between helping students develop fluency in performing mathematical calculations and helping students develop a deeper conceptual understanding of math using knowledge gained to solve real-world problems, readiness to take on the next level of complexity in learning, and preparing for the next phase of instruction, which is ultimately going to be, for all of our students, preparation for college and career, all require more rigor and depth in our teaching and in the learning that's happening. So, listen to the words that I'm using. Analyzing complex tasks, texts, articulating claims, reasoning, conveying complex ideas, acquiring and using academic vocabulary, <coughs> solving unfamiliar problems, deepening understanding through analysis, and applying concepts. These are all examples of expectations of students that require skills beyond just the acquisition of new knowledge. And the expectation is expected to be there 
and present developmentally appropriate for all of our students. Adaptation three involves the teacher providing direct instruction and continually re reinforcing effective thinking and processing skills in his or her students. Like acquiring other skills, students need to learn these mental skills, what we call cognitive skills, by seeing, practicing, and refining their thinking and processing within the context of the content that they're learning. So within the context of learning what they're supposed to be learning in their class, content-wise. Cognitive skills, which are really focused more on intrapersonal and interpersonal skills, they also need to be directly taught to students. These mindsets and habits of work require direct teaching to students and the opportunity then built within lessons and units of study for students to practice things like cooperation, collaboration, communication, creative problem solving, so that they are prepared to function in a workplace as an engaged worker and in the society as an engaged um, uh, citizen. Not surprising then, giving these adaptations one, two, and three, which preceded extraordinary efforts, need to be re redirected to how we plan what and how to teach our students. All school leaders, teachers, and instructional staff, and support professionals need to take their planning ratcheting it up to another level. Time needs to be dedicated to thoughtful evaluation, selection, and rollout of curriculum. And that's to be done collaboratively, not independently. The work of planning and developing lessons and units that are truly responsive to the needs of students, and when I say responsive, I mean enabling them to meet those higher expectation levels, needs to be done collaboratively well, at the same time, we're working to improve the quality of instruction that's happening in the classroom. Grade levels lose their significance as the focus becomes and the emphasis, the focus and emphasis is placed on coherency and seamlessness, connecting from one level of complexity to the next level of complexity. The selection of materials to support instruction Two, then becomes a collaborative, collaborative process. All of the adaptations presented get fully integrated into the plan of what instructional strategies will be used, how rigor and depth will be increased, and when the mental skills required of students will be taught and integrated into the instruction. I'm pleased that I've been able to kick off this workshop tonight with this analysis that was my capture of what the Leadership Council um, did in one of our joint sessions. We hope that this analysis provides a context for the presentations which follow. I know that it will, and that is the report out on student progress that Monique will be uh, presenting and the technology investment proposal which will be a, a, a joint presentation um, with uh, Monique and uh, with Jen. And Sue Ketch, <laughs> who's, who's here to fill in for the, the, the very not so feeling good uh, uh, David Preach. Thank you, Sue, for being here. Okay. So, as it relates to the need for more collaborative teacher learning time, and hence the discussion that's been happening. Um, and, the, and the vetting that has been happening about the proposed school calendar changes for next year. I've taken the liberty of creating this list of why that time is so desperately needed. The list is likely incomplete, but it includes um, essentially helping all of our teachers and giving them the time that they need to identify essential content, to plan and practice model lessons, to enhance the rigor and depth of an instruction, to develop proficiency scales and common assessments, to pursue critical inquiry questions, to do benchmark marking of curriculum and, and instructional quality with, uh, with other high performing schools, to access teacher learning resources, to integrate technology more effectively, 
to embed cognitive skills, those intrapersonal, interpersonal skills, to embed cognitive skills, to advance career readiness skills, and to guarantee that our curriculum is both horizontally and vertically, vertically aligned. So conversely, what will that time not be used for? Uh, well, that can be found on this list. And again, I'm very certain that this is not complete, but hopefully capturing what I believe are some of the more common misconceptions about what will be uh, done if more time is allocated into the calendar for, for teacher learning. That list includes, they will not be using the time to grade papers, to catch up, to prepare lessons in isolation, to do printing and collating, to do bulletin boards, to do faculty meetings or committee meetings, to do mandatory trainings, to work on their certification or their recertification, to fulfill their duties in, in their building, to do report cards, to write reports of any kind, to engage in staff wellness activities, to file or to organize or anything else that's clerical, to prepare for meetings, or, for, or to use this time as meeting time for those meetings that are currently scheduled either before or after school. So basically, what this additional time is not going to be used for is anything that does not advance the quality of teaching and learning consistent with this vision. I think it's just one, one last note. I think it is important to note that the proposal that came from the Leadership Council was thoughtful and very thoughtfully and very analytically developed. We recognize that the greatest inconvenience uh, that this uh, new calendar would create is really for our parents and for our students, with lots of possible headaches around logistics, financial issues, and just general disruption. As the leadership team, we know, however, that the greatest benefit that's going to be derived from this investment in time will also be to students and to parents. As far as lost instructional time, we as a team believe that the benefits to be gained through this increase in instructional quality will far outweigh the decrease in instructional time. We are not focused on quantity, we're focused on quality, and in doing that analysis, it's our belief that the investment is what is, is, um, is going to uh, uh, basically outweigh uh, any loss of, of instructional time, the investment in our teachers and the quality of what we're doing in the classroom. Thank you. Thoughts, questions, comments? Um, a couple of this may get addressed a later with M Monique as well. They're more kind of general principle kind of questions. Um, I, I'm going to make a couple of assumptions, so please correct me if those are inaccurate. Um, Common Core will set the content requirements for instruction. Is that correct? Uh, we use Common Core as a guide, essentially, as I said, from 1997 when the main learning results uh, were adopted. Um, uh, good school districts like Scarborough and other good districts use those um, learning results to guide them. They were heavily aligned with um, the national standards and where we didn't like, I'm sure that this happened in Scarborough, but where we didn't like, for example, in Falmouth, uh, where we did not like um, what we saw um, with the uh, main learning results, we thought that if they were weak, we went to the national standards for whatever the content area was. And common, the common core is really, is really moving all of us in the right direction to ask the question about if, does this student know this? And if yes, then does he know how to apply it? And that's really, that's really the, the flip in terms of Common Core. So yes, to the extent that it would be, um, that, that it would be guiding us in that direction. Um, no to the extent that we are seeing it as something that's something different from what we're already doing. Okay. Um, and then performance-based diplomas will set the expectations for that performance level. Is that correct? Well, um, we will actually set the, 
those expectations in terms of proficiency and, um, and how students will demonstrate proficiency. But we do have to have, a, as you know, we have to have a system in place. Um, we had the visitors come from DOE. Uh, they were highly complimentary. Um, the final report has come in. I have been buried. It's somewhere in there, and I'm going to be sharing it with folks. Um, but they were highly complimentary on the work that we're doing and basically are fully supportive in the way that we have um, tackled this improvement process in instruction and, uh, and institute learning. Okay, so if Common Core is, is generally content, performance is, is expectations or the performance level, this Marzano process is really the method for achieving those goals, you correct? Got you got it. It's really, okay. it's really our tool and it's a very sophisticated, very rich, very rich tool um, that will allow us to, to achieve both of those things. And um, yes. So okay, so that was by assumptions. Now are my questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what does standard testing play uh, in these three parameters, and how uh, are those results going to affect the teaching techniques? Well, um, I know there's a lot of thinking and talking about standardized testing. There's some bills that, that are being introduced into the legislature about, you know, uh, restricting testing at certain levels and so on. I think. Um, I think that we in Scarborough, with the work that we're doing, again, for the last 40 months and for the next 40 months that we'll be working on this, I think that we are in one of the better positions that I have seen to be able to look at the results of standardized testing and truly understand what we need to do to make some adjustments, to really use the <coughs> testing results for the purpose intended, which is to inform the way that we do instruction. I wouldn't say that was probably the case. Probably, let me tell you, maybe eight or ten years ago, probably was not the case. Um, but I certainly think that it is now. So, so the standardized instruction would be, I mean, the standardized testing and the results would be used for its intended purpose. And I think, and and we are in a very strong position and getting stronger to really utilize that in a way that directly benefits how teachers teach and how kids learn. And, and then the last question, um, I, I know we don't have any guarantees, but what are our thoughts on when all of these requirements come to fruition in terms of state law? Uh, is the work that we're doing now going to be affected in a way that um, Meaning, are we doing a lot of things now over and above, or are we, uh, when, the, when performance based diplomas come down from a mandate from above, are we going to have to adjust processes and pro programs again to meet those standards, or are we yeah. anticipating that we're that far ahead that whatever we have in place is going to either meet or exceed the state requirements? Um, I think that I would not use some of your same words. Okay. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Which is how you and I kind of have talk sometimes. Uh, but uh, I would say that the work that we're doing now, even confirmed by the DOE that more myopically looks at how you do proficiency-based diplomas, um, really has, is building a strong foundation. We'll continue to, to, to build that um, so that when we do a proficiency-based, competency-based diploma of, of some sort, um, it, it will not just be window dressing, it will be real because the the systems and the structures beneath it will, will be real as well. Thank you. Uh, are we doing uh, this type of training in isolation in Scarborough, or are we working collaboratively uh, on this with other school districts? That's really great. We, um, uh, uh, Joanne and Ann Lovejoy, who are the co-chairs of the, the PLT um, that, is, that continues to work on the uh, pr uh, performance evaluation and uh, professional growth system, the Marzano system, if you will, and all of the other many people who are involved, including teachers and, and um, uh, leadership council members and uh, teacher leaders and so on. Um, they have orchestrated um, a collaborative effort uh, so that how many, Joanne can probably speak to it better, actually, how many different districts? Um, we had uh 11 different districts who participated in different trainings. We had a training in August, a two-day workshop, 
in looking at the domain one of the Mars Auto model, which was just for our leadership group, teacher leaders, and, um, and, and did that in August. From that, we realized that we needed more uh, training in how to use the model, so we collaborated with these other districts, and um, we had three different training days with um, probably 120 people who attended on each day. Um, and so we're, we've been working with these other districts, trying to learn the Mars Auto model, sharing the cost, because we each realized we wouldn't be able to do this on our own to get this kind of training. So we've had three more uh, trainings for our school leaders and also for our teacher leaders. Who provides the training? The Mars Auto, the Learning Sciences International. We have a trained consultant who um, has done the four uh, different trainings that we haven't had. But through that synergy, there's also cost savings. Yes. Yes. Um, Jane had her. Oh. <laughs> I know we, we jumped on the model on wagon for a couple of years now. You know, we've been giving those books to teachers to read. Um, however, what I see this is more like and when you say every teacher has to learn this way and every student has to be taught this way, that sounds to, for me, sounds like every single subject is using a certain framework to, you know, to teach. It sounds too much like a cookie cutter, you know, exactly. approach. Um, you know, when, the, I don't know if, I mean, just, I could be wrong, I mean, just, yeah. I just my impression of it. Um, you know, that's what I'm afraid of. So, you know, I know I have bounced with some of the books, you know, we, ha we hand over out and say, you know, you have to, you know, step, nine steps, you have to go through this learning subject matters. I mean, how will, have you done uh, any kind of, you know, career, any kind of survey with the teachers? I mean, what after they read these books for the past few years, how do they, you know, respond to this, you know, this kind of approach or this initiative going forward? Well, I think you're asking two questions. One is, is it a cookie cutter approach? I am Mr. Anti-Cookie Cutter. Um, I was up at the DOE saying, what you're trying to do with proficiency-based diplomas is cookie cutter. It's not going to work. This is what I see to be, trans and the team sees to be, as transformative change. Um, good practice, good um, and reliable um, uh, approaches to teaching are, are scientifically based, but we also encourage the art form that is part of teaching as well. So it's both an art and a science. And the base Bible of the Marzano group is the art and science of teaching, which says know and understand and practice the, the scientific research-based strategies that work with kids, but also perfect your art form in terms of knowing when to pull in certain strategies for certain kids at certain times with certain materials so that it's not cookie cutter at all. It's, it is, it's the same way that someone um, who is a creative dancer needs to learn probably, you know, a hundred basic different moves, but how they combine those moves really depends on what it is that they're doing the story that they're telling. And for us, it's for teachers to be doing that based on reading the classroom and, and, and based on who needs what. And we have done a number of, every session that we do, for example, in the Art and Science seminar this year, every session um, has had feedback from teachers. And those sessions mm -hmm. have been um, all, almost entirely positive. Um, in terms of um, the uh, the, P the PLT work that we do, again, they're, they're focusing on inquiry questions, they're looking at certain strategies that they are learning and certain objectives that they have. Um, we have. The feedback that we're getting from our PLT facilitators, again, again, is that they're making good progress, it's meaningful work, people are engaged, and so on, and, and you'll get to be there for the May 22nd PLT, um, uh, sort of final day of PLT. So. I mean, since we have this amount of investment, we need to put in the project. So I know it sounds really great if this thing really works, but is there any research or tax record in nationwide? I know uh, the Florida, New, New Jersey, a couple of states have adopted the teacher evaluation model. And any, I mean, 
are we really ahead of everybody, or is this something that we can say, you know, what somebody have a track record, they have succeeded in doing this, and they have been showing your good results, and you know, this way, why we are going to do it? I know there are several uh, teaching value leading teacher evaluation model out there, but Mazama is one of them. So um, this was this was right. Mar you know, Marzano and, and there are others. Marzano is is um, is not only internationally um, endorsed, but but um, not only nationally endorsed, but internationally endorsed. As I said, Marzano is known as the um, the expert, the sort of the expert foundation on educational research. Are we ahead of everybody? No. Would we be where we are right now if the state didn't tell us that we needed to uh, do this? Uh, yes, we would be right in the same place because in, in the movement that we have been making over the last 40 months, including the last two years when we started looking at evaluation systems, we knew that that was going to be a critical piece of the teacher learning system that needs to be in place in order to make sure that we, we are building the right structures and system around our kids. So, any, I mean, I know he has good reputation. I mean, this is a for-profit organization that's pushing this, and everything we do, we have to pay money for it. So, is there any, I mean, success story that you have learned of, you know, which district has seen and put doing this for you for a few years? Right. I, can, I can provide you some of the, the research that, that they've provided to us. It's quite extensive. That would be great. That would be nice to see some sure. Jack, Jackie. Oh, Christine was next. I was just going to ask Joanne. So, of the uh, other districts that have been coming to these, they've obviously decided to adopt Marzano as well. Yes. Are any of them any of the ones that we talk about when we're talking about mm -hmm. comparing ourselves with? Yes. Would you be at liberty to say who these <laughs> districts are or not? And that's yes. not. Um, we've done a lot of work with uh, Tossum. I don't know their RSU numbers off the top of my head, okay? But um, there is Thompson, there's Bonnie Eagle, there is um, Bowden, Bodenham. Bowden, Bodenham. There's a whole um, in Western Maine um, above Augusta. They've all um, used the Marzano model and have a collaborative there too. Um, so we can see this as kind of a partnership going forward, perhaps, to keep cost sharing as you have to have more trainings and things like that? Yes. Okay. That's, we just happened to be talking one day at another uh, event and started talking, oh, you're doing Mazzano, you're doing Mazzano. We talked about what we did over the summer for our teacher leaders, our school leaders, or people who are on the uh, committee to review the teacher evaluation system and started talking about how we're going to get this other training and we started um, a group. Collaborative effort. Yeah, we, they call it Friends of Marzano now. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's a support group. group. <laughs> it's a support <laughs> group. It's a support group. It's a support group. How are we going to do this with limited you know, resources to do this kind of training? And so um, we've been hosting it here in Scarborough because it's more of a central place for people to get to. Um, okay. Thank you. <coughs> I think and, and just important to know is that early on in this district, before I arrived here four years ago, um, this was kind of a Marzano-centric district. They were really doing a, a, a good bit of work and exploration around the Marzano. So it's been a long-standing uh, focus and relationship uh, for Scarbo. Just recently, I heard a criticism that, that I can neither confirm or of, you know, and it, that when when a special ed student completed an IEP, it didn't necessarily prepare them to do anything. In other words, they weren't prepared, if capable, of entering the workforce or uh, going on to any other education. And I know some of that has evolved over the last seven or eight years, and we have programs in place for that. But specifically, how does this type of teacher training affect our children who are in special ed and the children, our students, who are in alternative ed? Uh, this is the, the same learning that is happening for every teacher. So 
special ed teachers, alternative ed teachers, are learning these same strategies. They're, they're, they're learning um, uh, how to address those same expectations for all students, and then consistent with whatever the, the student's uh, special needs might be. So it is, it is, it is, it is, it is ratcheting up and lifting instruction across the district for all students. But does it put more emphasis on, uh, what do I want to say, career? We're placing more emphasis on, on, on career prep, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, Monique? Monique is going to uh, report out on student conduct. I um, did not have a Prezi handout. They're rather difficult to hand out, um, but I will I will put one up on the um, we'll put one up on the website. And um, if you would like a special copy in your inbox, I can arrange for that as well. Um, I do. I do. I basically created that presentation as an article as well, that will be um, that will be uh, posted on the website, and okay. and the uh, school board can do uh, with it as as you wish as well. Uh, this is an annual report I usually do, and I come prepared with about 35 to 45 slides of all kinds of student data. And we're going to switch things up a little bit this year. Uh, we're going to switch things up for a few reasons. One reason in particular is that data doesn't just come to us in terms of numbers and standardized test scores. Uh, another reason is that uh, we are in the midst of quite a few transitions this year with assessments. Uh, <coughs> In our K-3, we are transitioning to a what's called Children's Progress Assessment. It measures ELA, English Language Arts. Thank you. Kristen, if you would like something else, that'd be terrific. Thank it's, you so much. It's, it's this one. I'll give you half of my take out. There are some handouts. <laughs> This is our second year for all the grade C students to take part in this assessment. If it's not an assessment like we think maybe the new MEA is, it's a small 20 minute student sit down at the computer, they listen to directions, they respond on the computer. It does not take a lot of time and it gives us some important data. And when I say us, it really gives the classroom teacher data on where the instructional target area is for the child. So it's most useful within the classroom. <coughs> but we're using this across grades K through 3. Again, the theme is transition here, so the data follows the particular student. We're also switching from NWA to what are called STAR assessments. Again, shorter in terms of time frame for implementation, provides us better data, it's a better testing experience for the child, and it's also less expensive. We are continuing with the Ready, Step, PSAT, SAT, because that helps track our college and career readiness data. And this year, of course, we have the first year of the um, new MEA state assessment. Uh, it's online, it's adaptive, and there are practice test items. There are also interim items and summative assessments as well. So we're not going to report on a lot of data this year. Maybe I'll get to put my charts and graphs together again for next year. But I am very excited to talk about uh, what's happening at three different phase levels in the district. <coughs> Specifically K-5, we, as you know, we heavily invested in a um, literacy initiative. Uh, and that is in terms of people, time, as well as money. Uh, teachers have been involved, K-5, all teachers, special ed teachers, as well, um, <coughs> have been involved in summer professional development workshops where we hired consultants to come and train the teachers over the summer. We also have after school grade level meetings, uh, curriculum meetings where teachers reflect on what's happening, what's going on, and we also have professional development during the day in classrooms. And this is the challenge with our calendar is that we have to release teachers and hire subs for students impacting their instructional time 
So they can go and review um, and watch a model lesson, get feedback, or do a model lesson and get feedback on that piece. Uh, we also have invested in terms of an instructional coach. We had one shared across K-5 that wasn't sufficient. We took a look at funding, reallocated funding, so that we have one full-time person at K-2 and 3-5. So K-5, on uh, the back of this packet, um, there's a whole lot of information in a very small space on that slide, but in the back of your packet, there's a full page of these observations. Essentially, uh, just to highlight, what we're seeing is we're seeing students and teachers very excited about writing. Students are becoming more independent regarding their writing. There are integration opportunities with their writing. And we have a common, consistent format timeline with instructional units. Uh, but we also have teachers wanting, surprise, more time to better plan, plan their units, to also access the instructional coaches and our consultants as well, because they want to continue planning better lessons. In short, I'll highlight a few of the things on the back of that page, in the back of your packet, what teachers are saying at this point in the year, which is March, they, a kindergarten teacher, they can read it, and so can adults in terms of students' writing. Another comment from a second grade teacher, richer vocabulary is being used, and opinions are being supported with examples and reasoning, reasons in, within the student writing. Another comment, when kids hear themselves being called writers, they feel it. It makes a difference, and that's part of this program's instruction is that we are all writers and we're going to do as writers do. Of particular interest is what the students are saying about what's going on. We're hearing comments, oh, do we have to stop writing now? Another comment from a first grade student, we learned that you need to use punctuation and where to put uppercase and lowercase letters. This is a first grade student. We need to spell words correctly, like the word because. We get to write different books, like seed stories, how-to books, and reviews. This is what the Common Core Standards are saying. This is what's meant by rigor. Students are using the vocabulary of the content. This didn't happen in the past. Another comment. A three, four students talking to a partner about introduction. I like that you started your information with a question It made me think. So students are supporting each other. Again, that is one of the shifts within the common core standards that Dr. Antipas spoke of. And a fifth grade student, I see you're trying to show me your character, but have you thought of trying to tell me what your character is thinking? So they're learning how to provide feedback to each other. Now let's take a look at the student work. What you have before you is a sample of a first grade writing prompt in the fall of September. And there are little descriptions there, just a sketch, no words, one page. The same prompt, same amount of time for both pieces of writing. In November, not March, in November that same first grader provided six pages illustrated, divided into sections with bit by bit details, words, and pictures. Another, a third grader in September provided a piece of writing with a title, some details, but single page. In November, from September to November, this third grader provided an introduction to start this piece, titles, chapters, subtitles, detailed actions, descriptions, conclusions, and two and a half pages of writing. The initial focus when we're launching these writers' workshops is to really help build students' stamina in writing. As you can see, it's happening. Fifth grade. Here's a sample of fifth grade work, and this is illustrative of all fifth graders and all grade levels. This is not the wow pieces that we sometimes see. Fifth grader simply lists some ideas within categories about the topic. It was only one paragraph. Uh, by February, they were doing comparative analysis. For example, um, they organized the writing with a table of contents, with titles, they added details to sketches, there was strong voice, <coughs> when there are subtopics, and it was five pages long. And just in case you can't read that on the slide, 
I'll pass around here the samples of the students' writing if you'd like to take a closer look of their growth. Now, we used to have writing prompts in the fall and in the spring. Uh, and when I talked to the teachers and we took a look at some of those old samples, uh, in comparison, we're seeing more writing, even at this point in time, that are quality of writing across multiple genres than we did in the spring using our old, older writing prompts. So significant growth in the area of writing uh, <coughs> at the K-5. I'm going to switch to the middle school now and talk a little bit about the progress and those investments at the middle school as well. As you know, there's a new schedule at the middle school this year. We did presentations last year on that. What we're finding at the middle school is that tardinesses are down and course failures are down. Students are performing better. There are also improvements in the curriculum continuity uh, within grade levels and across grade levels. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, mostly because of the restrictions of time. Um, I had to pull this year, I pulled in order to do some work with science, I had to pull teachers from their instruction to do the curriculum work in regard to the science standards. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking to avoid doing in the future if we have the time that we're proposing in the school calendar moving forward. We also at the middle school, as a result of investments made in last year's budget, have added staff, particularly in world languages. I'd like to highlight that piece, but there are also staff in uh, music as well as art. And I'll show you some samples of what the impact that's had at the high school in a bit. Focusing on middle school and world languages. As you know, we've been rebuilding world languages. And it certainly has been in collaboration with the high school foreign language department. Uh, in conversations as we began to talk about rebuilding these programs, it was a high school that shared with us the current research which <coughs> led us to go visit Glastonbury, Connecticut, a high performing school district to take a look at what they're doing in terms of instructional practices and that's the direction we've taken in terms of providing significant amounts of time at the 8th grade level so that students can truly build fluency. They're speaking Spanish, they're speaking French in the 8th grade and world languages has become a core. In other words, students are receiving world language instruction every day, just like they receive literacy instruction every day in an effort to build fluency. Certainly, grade six and seventh we're building uh, six three times a week, and seventh is excuse me, six is once a week, and seventh is three times a week. So, for example, taking a look at what the middle school has um, been able to do. Uh, talking with a uh, world language teacher, uh, she was able to pull up via the internet an actual restaurant menu from Colombia. And she had students reading the menu in their classrooms and trying to figure out what they might order. Well, in order to do that, they had to read and figure out the words, the language, the vocabulary. And they were able to do that, even for the words they didn't know. They saw patterns, and they knew some of the words, and so they were able to fill in the pieces. So they were learning more vocabulary as they were doing this. And then, as they practiced ordering from the restaurant. Another activity that I observed just this week was actually an assessment. The world language teachers were using a, um, an online application called Google Classroom where uh, they could see these slides and the teacher had it up front. Uh, and basically they had to put these slides, these conversations that would have occurred in a restaurant in order. And they had to identify the responses that were happening on the, on, via the pictures. And so the students were on their laptops and they had a, what's called a Google form where they entered the A's, B's, C's, and D's. They could go back and forth to double check themselves, but then they'd enter those answers and the teacher had immediate feedback as to where the students were, what they knew, what they, where they needed to go back to do some more instruction. <coughs> Wonderful classroom example. At the high school, the investments that the community has made has been in the area of the arts. There are additional uh, portions of positions that were added to the budget that have allowed not only new courses, but more sections offered at the high school. 
So that additional staffing in the arts has created a couple of new courses, one being digital photography, another graphic design, and in the area of performing arts and music, voice and piano two. If you recall in the past, uh, piano two students um, were also, sometimes they, what they would have to do is either do an independent study with the teacher or they were mixed in with a piano one student. A couple of examples in digital photography. This um, is an image of the digital photography lab. At the high school, it fits between two art classes. You'll notice there are um, a few desktops there. I believe there are only six to eight desktops in that room. They do not have access to sufficient computers for digital photography. So what the teacher does is she takes the student has to sign out a lab uh, one of the three labs that are available in order to have her classes um, use the um, digital tools via the computer. As you can see within her classroom, she has um, some of the images that students have been working on in her classroom. And in her classroom, she has tools such as mats and cutting and paper and mounting boards, but they have to do their work in the computer lab where they can't bring up that equipment and they come back to the digital um, to the classroom, the art classroom to finish up. What I'd like to show you, though, is a couple of activities that they are able to do, just to give you an illustration. This particular activity, I'm sure you can't read it, but it's really a uh, student are to take about 20 photos um, of the man-made environment and of the natural environment. And the purpose of this lesson was for students to work with a shallow depth of field, but also to work with their digital cameras on selective focus. So here are a couple of examples of some pieces that the students have done in digital photography that illustrate that shallow depth of field, but also selective focus. Here's another piece. And a third piece in digital photography. In graphic design, it's an interesting project that the teacher works with the students on. It's identity through text. This is an activity where students use Photoshop, but what they need to explore is their own identity through words, and then they create a visual image using a hand. So they have to take a picture of their hand, and then they have to enter, use Photoshop to enter the, the, um, the word. What they focus on is I am, I believe, I hope, and the idea is to come up with as many words to represent who they are. Of course, their objective. Here are some samples of the good student work, fine student work that they've done. You can see family, happy, brave. Another example, a particular font. And finally, last example on that. So as you can see, we've made progress in the areas that we have invested in, but as usual, uh, in the uh, Dr. Entwistle style, there's always more improvements that we can make. Uh, and so I'd like to highlight a few of those. At the K-5, K we are going to continue with the literacy initiative. <coughs> slow down a bit, given the restrictions that we have in terms of time. But we're going to continue focusing on <coughs> work on word knowledge. That's the phonics, the English awareness and spelling. We're also going to take some time to build classroom libraries to make sure we have equitable libraries across the district. And certainly we have teachers willing and interested to continue working on improving their literacy instructional strategies. <coughs> At the middle school, we're going to continue to work um, and seek that cross-grade level and cross-content curriculum connection. Um, and the middle school is working particularly on improving their unit and lesson design and working in teams to do so, but also to seek those effective practices that enhance student engagement in their learning so that students take responsibility for their learning. At the high school, we're going to continue to focus on college and career readiness. High school's been busy and will continue to be busy researching and developing new schedule options. As you can see, those courses that I talked about, we have additional staff and we're able to offer more courses, but in some situations, students aren't able to take them because they're not able to fit the <coughs> schedule. This is not new information for you folks, but what's happening and what we're hearing is that, for example, in band or chorus, there are freshmen reporting that they have to drop those courses because there are other classes they want to take. And that just feels like it's just a little too early on to make that kind of a decision in a child's high school career. 
High school is also going to be very busy next year preparing for the NEAS, the reaccreditation process. It is a self-study, self-improvement process that falls right in line with our 24-month improvement strategy. And certainly they are working very hard at preparing for a one-to-one -one instructional environment, which you'll get more details on in the next presentation. Questions? Um, a few, sorry, um, you talked about the uh, assessments K-3, there's yeah. been a lot of kind of, I, I guess, uh, talk lately around assessing creativity and the need to assess at that level, um, you know, what, 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 what are the impacts of those testing, what are they used for? Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how are we, t are we taking into account any kind of creativity methods or is it purely just analytical type of testing? Uh, as you know, not all tests can assess everything. Uh, one of the pieces that I've been working with our uh, technology instructional coaches is taking a look at those technologies, the national technology standards, um, of which um, creative thinking, innovation are part of that. And what we've been doing is we've been researching um, uh, what's called design thinking model, and so we've identified the design thinking model out of the Stanford um, School of Design, uh, and we're going to be, again, this is a time thing, um, sharing that design model with staff, providing professional development on that, so they can learn not only how to teach creativity innovation um, through the design thinking model, but also how <coughs> to assess that, which typically will be through um, an observation process with rubrics and those pieces. So we're trying to keep that tightly tied to instruction as possible. Okay. Um, I, I know we're using a lot of our testing data for direct classroom feedback and, and, and curriculum focus. What, are the state, what is the state and the Fed using that data for? I mean, obviously we've got um, rankings and we have funding tied to certain things. Which, which uh, assessments are used for those purposes and what extra ones or additional ones are we doing just for classroom feedback? Uh, the, um, the only assessment that the state has access to is the MEA. Okay. Uh, and for that data, when they pull that data, they will do their state report card over time. The federal government will look at our group student performance in order to determine accountability. In the past, it was typically called adequate yearly progress to ensure that schools are progressing and improving their student performance. Uh, but that is all group data. Uh, locally, we look at individual data in order to, and we use the NEA, we use our district assessments as another <coughs> data point. We use uh, classroom assessments. Uh, we be, are building common assessments as part of our classroom process in order to inform instruction, but also in terms of giving us some evidence as to whether or not students are meeting those instructional standards. So we use them group-wise to take a look at what are, what are our strengths in terms of our curriculum and also what are the areas we need to work on. For example, it would probably make common sense that we would start with reading in our literacy initiative because you would think that reading comes first. Well, our writing performance, looking at our writing data, was worse than our reading performance. What we're also noticing right now is we're focusing on writing is that <coughs> our reading performance is increasing. So they're tied together. So if we're comfortable letting that go for a year, continue to focus on the writing, and then bring the reading in. That's a direct result of an action taken as we've looked at the data. That, that, that brings me to the, one of my other questions. Um, a couple months ago, we were up and we laid out each, each group, K-5, I think it was, and then intermediate, middle school, high school, and the areas we identified as really needing improvement mm -hmm. on the high school mm -hmm. level. I'd really like to circle back around and see that okay. data again yep. um, because I know we're pinning a lot of investments to performance in terms of, now, we may not want to use that as a sole indicator of performance understood, but it's, it's that hard analytical data that we can show trending. With, with investments that I think is important and critical, and I, I would like to circle back around and see some of that for the budget season, so we can, we can tie some of that together. Yes, I can provide that. Okay, um, and then the last question is the, the um, digital photography and the arts and stuff. Um, high school, I think it's great that we can offer those things. How are they relating to the stuff happening in the vote centers as well? Because I know, I think it was Westbrook or maybe Pats had a, had a really good um, graphic arts department and a graphic arts program. Are we trying to complement each other there or 
I know scheduling is a challenge and things like that, but. Absolutely, but it, what will happen is that if uh, teachers identify students who have an interest or a, a, a talent in an area and wish to pursue that and move into the vocational school system to continue that, um, that pursuit, um, they'll make those recommendations, have the conversation with the student, and also in conjunction with the guidance counselor um, as well to pursue that opportunity. So the VOC are more like full programs in graphic and arts, and not just a one-time class. Far more okay. depth than yep. we could ever offer <laughs> at the Scarborough High School. Um, we right. even still, even with these courses, we're still challenged to offer, we typically have introductory level courses, mid-courses, like uh, Voice 2 or Painting 2, um, and we still are, in terms of another level of rigor, a third year of art. Students either have to move crosswise, move into other media, um, but the design, and we've, we've never been able to um, uh, been able to afford to have the staffing to be able to offer an, an AT Studio Art, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, our offerings are still quite limited for a school this size. And that just kind of triggers one more question. I know the scheduling is critical. Are we offering those types of classes to upperclassmen, junior, seniors, or at the introductory level, freshmen, sophomores, when they have the time to evaluate, maybe they do want graphic arts and now they can shift into a a, a both kind of situation? Yes, yeah, so there's, a, there's a, a typically the entrance course in the arts is foundations mm -hmm. or ceramics one, mm -hmm. and from there they can take for more classes, as many classes as their schedule allows and their interest. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. You're welcome. I'm familiar with a couple of school districts that uh, provide uh, teacher time so that grade level teachers can meet at least once a week. And they do that by having, say, all the second grades engage in art, music, physical education, library at the same time so that the teachers can meet. Yep. And, and uh, one school my sister taught in, they found that extremely helpful. They met twice a week, by the way, but uh, I know other districts who have provided that, and I wondered if, if we have given thought to that. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we would love to keep those students engaged in every instructional moment we possibly can. Uh, the challenge in there is the sheer cost of the additional staff we would need to hire in order to release those teachers to meet together. Uh, for example, at Wentworth School, we have, uh, is it nine or 13 classrooms per grade? We have nine classrooms per grade level. We only have two art teachers. So it, it's a staffing issue. Um, I would absolutely love to increase our art, music, uh, technology, uh, science offerings, but that would mean adding dozens of teachers. Uh, as you know, we've been cut back in the past in terms of staffing, and that has really just tightened up our schedules um, significantly. Uh, and, and that's where we just don't have that kind of flexibility anymore. You might be able to do a K-2. I mean, it's something to look at. Uh, we absolutely are looking at that, and we do that where we can. Okay. Uh, for example, the redesign of the middle school has allowed some time for some of that to take place. But also, as you recall, we invested in additional staff in order to make that happen. The high school redesign, they're thinking along those lines as well. For example, there's a new course um, in the course offerings this year called uh, History Through the Music of the 60s. Which is the idea is to team teach that a uh, music teacher and a history teacher. Um, whether or not the schedule will allow that, those two folks to come together and be available for that period of time is something that will have to be um, choreographed through the scheduling process. But in order to even have an entire math department meet during the day at the high school, there just aren't enough staff to accommodate the students to release those teachers for one period to have no math classes being taught during that one period. Thanks. Um, from what you have here, you know, this is a student progress, and uh, what you, I see is from grades three to eight have changed from NWA to STAR, and also state assessment, is that the smart banners coming up? Yes, it's called the MEA. So it looks like we are losing any benchmark to compare to for the prior years because this new, we don't have anything that continues 
we do what we do have we don't ha yet have trend data on this, mm -hmm. but what we do have is we have national with the star. Another reason we're going there is we do have national comparison data with a larger sample size than we ever had with the NWEA. So that's why it gives us better data, um, and we're able to um, set our um, cut scores based on national percentile ranks. So it gives us a more flexibility in being able to use that. That was the gift you get in making that transition. Okay. So, and for the piece, the high school so I we still have PSAT and SAT. PSAT is taken by all juniors, right? And the SAT is for sophomores and juniors. So, all sophomores and juniors. So, do we get any of those, you know, yes. information? Yes. Uh, to, to, to <coughs> those results. Yes. We mm -hmm. take advantage of. Um, the other reason for eliminating the NWBA, even though it gave us trend data, was it was becoming old and it was cost prohibitive. Uh, it was very, very expensive. This is a much less expensive solution. Likewise, with the PSAT, excuse me, the state is continuing to fund um, uh, <coughs> uh, the PSAT and the SAT this year anyway. Great. So we're able to take advantage of that um, cost reduction. So when will we be able to see the, you know, kind of the data of graphs you can provide? Oh, yeah. I'd be happy to show you all those graphs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, just to piggyback on one of Jane's questions, um, what other districts do we know of are, that are moving away from the NWAA to the STAR, or are we... Oh, my. Uh, is that a, a trend yeah. that we're seeing, or is Yes, that, it is, is a trend. Okay. Absolutely. The only districts, <coughs> excuse me, in this area that are not moving away are waiting because they don't want to let go of the trend data in light of the new MEA. Okay. For us, it, it, it was you know cost, uh, and when our teachers who were piloting and saw the quality of the data, they just and oh, the testing interface was just so much more student friendly, and it just was less time. Uh, were there other options out there, or is everybody kind of shifting towards the star? Uh, there were other options. Actually, it took us, it was a process that started three years ago in terms of looking around at other assessments. Uh, and so we piloted one other assessment pretty deeply. It, it met our criteria to even pilot, and we did that, and it, it just was not friendly enough for us, nor was it as cost effective as the star. I just a uh, quick question. Um, we are exempt from the notes child left behind, so we are not, are we still finding those report cards or we are not anymore? The, the no child left behind. The, the no child left behind accountability reports will still continue. Okay. I don't know what they're going to look like with this new assessment. They're working on those, but those will still continue. Okay. Awesome. So. Thank you. <coughs> I just have one question about the middle school now. Mm -hmm more than halfway through the year. Um, with the tweaking of the schedule, complete success or will there be a couple of tweaks to improve things next year? Uh, as we were getting ready to come downstairs and I was just double checking with uh, Barbara Hathorne, oh, but I want to change that next year. Uh, and not huge changes, but um, there are we're learning as we're going along, and I think um, there will be some some small shifts and improvements uh, in the ever ongoing um, continuous um, effort to improve things. Um, and, and a lot of it is maxim it's maximizing time for instruction and the quality of instruction that takes place. That's funny because when I was visiting uh, Barbara today, she told me that pretty much uh, nothing was going to change. <laughs> she's going to keep it. She's going to keep it in place and let it go in. Pretty much, I said pretty much everything is going to stay the same and allow it to settle in another year. She didn't say for how long. I know. That left the door open. <laughs> Anyone else have anything to stop this? Thank you. It was very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, 7.3, uh, presentation of the technology capacity building for the Scarborough High School. And this presentation is titled Technology Investment Proposal for Scarborough High School. And um, I think that Monique is, are you kicking this off too? Uh, yeah, I believe I am. Okay, so I'll turn it over to you and let you um, orchestrate it. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kristen and I will pass these out.
grab one and pass that to me, please. What you have coming around are two sets of documents. Uh, you have a full proposal titled Technology Investment Proposal for Scarborough High School. You also have a copy of this PowerPoint. Do board members all have one of these? Yes. Yes. Okay. Does anyone want to use anything? You all have it too? Yes, I do. You might? The PowerPoint is a subset of the proposal. <coughs> Uh, so you have everything in the proposal, uh, and then some. We tried to provide all the information as we've been working on this proposal for quite some time, and working on this initiative um, over the past several years, actually. Uh, <coughs> PowerPoint will only highlight some of the pieces within the proposal, and I'll try to refer to certain page, pages for you, so that as you read the proposal, after the board meeting or during the board meeting, um, <laughs> you'll have some time to digest the thing. I will be presenting um, a portion. I'll talk about context and research in Scarborough. Uh, Sue Ketch, pinch hitting from Mr. Creech tonight, will be talking about Scarborough voices. In Scarborough. And Jen Lim will um, uh, wrap up the, the presentation with a description, a detailed description of the proposal itself and the components within the proposal. So starting out, what I'd like to um, bring to your attention uh, is a policy that you've approved. It's a policy um, that outlines our four goals that are within our strategic improvement plan. Uh, but please note the alignment with this proposal, this initiative for one-to-one -one laptops at the high school is one of our goals, most important in my mind, um, focusing on students, is to prepare every, <coughs> every student to be college and career ready, a basis of one of the main reasons why we're looking at a one-to-one -one initiative as opposed to a bring-your-own-device initiative. Likewise, uh, we're looking to develop skills for engaged citizenship, both globally and locally. These devices will allow us and our students the opportunity to interact globally and build knowledge globally and communicate globally. Also, policy AD, our philosophy, our philosophy and our mission, creating and maintaining standards which will furnish students with the skills necessary for success in a global society. I'd like to talk a little bit about learning then and now and how the philosophy is forward thinking. Uh, 21st century learning on the left is student-centered, it's interactive, there's a visual, that's an actual classroom at the Weber School just this year. Traditional, um, you may not notice that, but that may have been me back in my long hair days when I uh, taught math and I stood at the front of the board. And at one point in one school, there was actually a custodian who washed down the chalkboards at the end of the day. We've come a long way in terms of shifting from that teacher-directed static education to a more interactive classroom. You'll notice the difference in classrooms, even in a school, um, where we have computers, a computer lab is becoming archaic. It's old. Um, we're really talking about anywhere, any time, any place, sometimes even any pace learning. In addition, we're talking about access for all students with current <coughs> online education and events. Uh, here's a little example of that, a student working with a robotics um, application. Uh, that little um, mark to the right is called a QR code. So within classrooms, you can take your smartphone, 
scan that QR code and it will lead to a website where you can take a look at a video of this student doing that activity. If you don't have your smartphone handy or if it doesn't work on that PowerPoint image for you, you can go to www.tinyurl.com backslash WS Legos to view the video of what students are doing in the classroom. Compare that to access for some information depending on whether or not the book was in your school library or the textbook was one in which you purchased, in which we have dated information. As you recall, we used to do five-year curriculum cycles. Remember that, Ms. Perry? Oh, and I would do a presentation and we would purchase a large batch of textbooks. Doesn't mean that print media is going away, it just has a much smaller role in education. Again, um, when we're doing assessments now, we're assessing for college, career, and civic readiness. Even the MEA standardized test has a portion of the test where <coughs> students are involved in a group in a learning activity, learning the context for a larger performance test. Uh, for example, they may be doing some research on a particular topic. They're having a conversation about common vocabulary. They go online. They do some additional reading. And they do an extended response item where they are being assessed on their research skills. Compare that to the old bubble and paper pencil assessments that certainly um, aren't going to assess the application of knowledge. So what does the research say in terms of the value of a one-to-one -one initiative? Uh, Project RED, in our research, Project RED is the first and the only one that we could find, uh, dated 2010, so there may be some others more recently um, um, going to be published, nearly a thousand schools, and they took a look at uh, not only one-to-one um, -one technology, but also how does that compare to student gains in regard to the money invested in the program. What they found was, across those thousand schools, employing a one-to-one -one computer ratio and with key implementation factors, schools that do so outperform other schools. So specifically, within one of their findings, those schools that employ those key <coughs> implementation factors outperform all schools in all other one-to-one -one schools. Within this graphic, the first set of bars, red indicates properly implemented one-to-one, -one, the blue all one-to-one, -one, and the gray all other schools. <coughs> and the categories are disciplinary action <coughs> reduction. The second is high stakes test scores. They increase. The third is dropout rate reduction, the reduction in the dropout rate. And the fourth is the increase in graduation rate. The full report is in the back. It's within the appendix within your um, proposal. If you'd like to take a look at the full report. In terms of educational impact, in terms of what's going on here in Scarborough and the voices, I'm going to turn it over to Sue Ketch. If you'd like to, you can sit there and I can move the slides if you want. Sure. Okay. That's great. So one of the things Principal Creech has been doing is meeting with both students and teachers in, in our building to um, talk to them, especially the ones that have been exposed to one-on-one -on -one opportunities, whether it's in a different district for teachers or a, in a pilot program for us where they had one-on-one -on -one in, in a classroom for a short period of time to try that, um, and also for students that may have come from another district or come from another building in our district where they had an opportunity for one-on-one. -on -one. And so the first slide talks about um, some things that we heard from students, and these are some examples. Um, I won't read them all to you, but um, a couple that come to mind for me, um, a student that you may know, Kristen Murray, said uh, one of her comments was, I do know that some students don't have computers at home, don't have access to that technology all the time. Writing papers, doing projects online can be difficult in that situation. And we do know that we have children in our building that are facing that challenge and um, it makes getting their schoolwork done just a lot harder. Um, also, I thought um, Emma Hartle's comments, technology is such a big part of education these days 
there are so many different uses for technology. The more our students know about technology and are using it, working efficiently with it can be very helpful in the future. So, you know, as, as we know students, uh, many, most of our students will be going on to a college setting where the technology will be vital and getting them using it and um, opportunities with that every single day is only going to um, increase their career and college <coughs> which is one of our prime goals. So also um, Mr. Creech spoke with teachers and um, in, in talking with staff um, there are some really common themes and some common language that came forward. Global learning community, that, that was one that was, was um, resonated with the comments that he received. And having real-time access to resources, um, being able to be on computers getting even textbooks and things and all of their new information and not relying on books that are five, eight, ten years old, that using through the technology and moving more toward textbooks in that venue, they will com be updated consistently. Kids will have more current information to be working with. More opportunities for customized or differentiated learning, where students can move more at their own pace. Um, and we think that's going to be a very important piece. And another thing that um, teachers were seeing consistently is student ownership and independence with their own learning. And we think that, again, getting them ready for college and career ready, then being independent learners and able to go out and access that ownership and, and work on that is just going to be very, a very strong thing for our students. Um, if you, in your packet, your, the, the really big one, um, if you can take the time, especially to look at pages 11 through 16, I know you can't do it right now, but um, I was really looking at that this afternoon, and there's some really wonderful explanations in there that talk, uh, teachers have given us information on how they did things traditionally, or maybe the way they learned it in college and when, when they were getting their undergrad work done, and how they've moved and changed to, to work on that information. And there's some really nice examples in your packet for many different subject areas and many different levels, so it's, it's just really interesting to read how in a wide variety of subjects we can make some changes and, and improve our work. Um, you know, some of the examples were teaching with news media, um, interactive lectures, um, online community work through social media and collaboration, learning through online resources, um, again, online tools for self-paced learning <laughs> and real-world applications which should help children at a variety of different levels, whether they need something slowed down to really master it or where they get it, and they want to move, jump ahead. So those are um, some, just some really important things that we've found in talking with students and staff in our building. Things we're really hoping to make some significant changes and improvements with. So following the voices, um, I'll turn it over to Jen Lim, who's going to talk and tell you more about the budget, technical end. Thank <laughs> God they didn't have me do that. <laughs> you could have done it. Um, the last time I presented an update to you guys, I think it was in January, we talked a little bit about the devices that we were looking at. So we were looking at a variety of things. If you recall, we actually did a functional requirements definition session with a couple of different groups at the high school. Um, and they told us what they needed, what their critical requirements, and then their sort of like nice to have would be for a device that would be used in their classroom and integrated into their curriculum. So um, that list is actually, I'm sorry, I wasn't together enough to have the page numbers. <laughs> um, that list is in that giant packet somewhere. It actually shows the requirements that were listed by the functional um, requirement group. And then um, we talked about the devices and how they met them. Page 19. 20. 19. 19. Thank you. 19. I'm, just, I'm just concerned that uh, they will not be able to hear okay, you on right the now. audio. I don't know how strong those are yet. I don't know if it can pull any further. There's, okay. there's, if you step up. Uh, maybe. There, there um, um, okay, so there was a latecomer, though, to the, the pool of devices that we were taking a look at. And if you recall, one of the um, critical components that I think you're really looking for was touch screen. 
One of the things I was a little concerned about, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to step away from that. Um, there is some slack if you want to pull it down. One of the things I was concerned about, this is a touch screen device, <laughs> and I was worried because what we've seen in the past with um, the laptop is that when kids were pushing on it or trying to open the devices, the hinges were cracking. So we went forward and we looked for something that had some flexibility to it, and I'm very happy that we found something within the price point that we were looking at that is actually a flex. So it folds into a tablet. It gives the students increased mobility. So if you wanted to, you know, there's some classes, digital photography, where they might want to go out and take pictures in the field. Um, if they're in a science class, we often see at the middle school in particular that they do have devices that they're going out and they're taking recordings of different things out in the field. Um, this would give them that sort of added flexibility. With this, when you fold this back, the keys actually retract. So you can set it down on a flat surface and, you know, with no fear of accidentally emailing somebody. Um, it's a, you know, it is a commercial grade device, so it's semi-ruggedized. I'll pass that around if you guys want to take a look at it. It's three and a half pounds. It meets all the other requirements, four gigs of RAM, 500 gig hard drive, selling your own processor, um, and again, it falls within that price point of what we were looking at. So this is our device of choice. It's $4.59 per unit, and then you can see the financial breakdown that's included in your giant packet. In the appendix, I think it's appendix C, there's actually a breakdown of all the devices that we looked at and all the models, um, that the different models that we, we um, Page 22 is where that particular device is. That is the Lenovo ThinkPad 11E 20D9 Flip. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Amazing, I know that. Um, so that's the model that we chose. We opted not to go with a VDI, uh, the virtual desktop interface. If you look at the packet, there's a description of exactly what that is. And we also opted not to go with a BYOD. If you look in the FAQ section, which is Appendix B, I think, of the giant document, page um, 32, that talks about why we opted not to go with those, those different options. Quick, yeah, quick question on the tablet, the flip. Uh, does it have stylus <coughs> capability? Can you write? Right on it, like take you know, you know what I'm saying? With I, the, with the yeah, couch. I don't. The, the actual device itself, I don't think, comes with that application. I believe that you can get an application that you know, you can do that with. It doesn't come with styluses though, so that's something that we would have to purchase. Does that use a touch screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can't see it over here. Was that? Did you have any other? No, that was it. Sorry. Okay. Any questions about the device itself? Why we chose it? Is this heavier than the HPs the middle schoolers have? You know, you, you think that, but it, 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 it feels like dead weight pounds. over here. Or something. I, but it, I, I like to concentrate it. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's very rugged. It, it, didn't, it doesn't feel heavier to me than the middle school one, but it's just more compact. I have done a drop test. <laughs> From how <laughs> high? Oh! Uh, for folks here. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Yeah, and it survived. It's, it was actually that particular one. So, you know, no crack screen, no crack case, no crack hinges. It so now you, you mentioned that students in the middle school take them outside to video or take pictures or whatever it is they're doing. Are, is there a cover for the bottom part? Like, how do they just take them out? They, they have down at the middle different. school, they actually have um, tablet devices that okay. they take take them out with. But yeah, we would, we're we likely going to look, because this is a smaller, you can see this is 11.6 inch screen as opposed to a full, this is a 14 inch. Um, so we'll probably look at sleeves for those because my guess is the kids will actually be sliding them into their backpacks. Right, right. So we'll look for some kind of rugged sleeve, not just like a thin neoprene, but it'll be something you know that will hold up to the sort of abuse it's likely to get. Um, so from a budget perspective, this is actually the device that we're looking at. You can see that the initial outlay is nearly a million dollars. <coughs> and then there's a more detailed um, explanation of this on page 30. Uh, 
It's actually in the part where we talk about the device. So, um, in the in the portion of the proposal where we talk about this particular device, you'll see a more detailed breakout of exactly what is included in these costs. Um, it's exactly nice of 6.5 hours. Just to assure you, this kind of is really going to last a long I mean, you know, sometimes you say, you know, you know, you know they claim a certain number and they actually don't last that much. It's, so a, you know, it's anybody's guess, and my guess mm -hmm. is that you know this device here will last you know three three hours if I have it on the highest setting for brightness on the screen, and I'm actually using it all the time and it never sleeps. If I just have it open on my desk and I have it set on the lowest brightness for the screen and it's sort of sleeping all the time, it could go ten hours. So it just depends on how much they're using them, what they're doing, you know, in the background. <clears throat> we find, in particular with the middle school laptops, that if they have a lot of things, um, widgets, you know, that they've loaded to the background that are constantly switching pictures or, you know, little gadgets, um, that will eat into the battery life as well. So we've, we've actually put some parameters on, you know, not loading those. To the, to the school owned devices, and we probably will do these as well. You're not worried about better I'm not. We, Lenovo is a very familiar vendor to us. I mean, we do on the town side, almost all of our devices are Lenovo. So um, we have a really good relationship with them. And, you know, I think that they would stand by their products if, if we found that we had some, some kind of faulty. I think what you're going to end up with is somewhere between, you know, five and seven hours of good solid battery life. But the plan is to have some charging stations and some spare chargers available at the school if kids need to actually charge at school. How long does it take to charge? In other words, if a student uses the computer most of the day and then goes home and wants to do homework, uh, how long <coughs> How long would it take to charge it up? Well, I would recommend if they're going to go home and do homework, I would recommend that they do their homework plugged in. <coughs> so it's charging while they're working on it. Ah, okay. And then leave it overnight, ready yeah. to go there. A <coughs> um, couple, couple things. Um, would this be the device that we would be moving to in the future for the entire district? Meaning, are we going to phase out the other models that we have now and move in that direction? It's, it's a good question, and part of the problem that we run into in making that determination is that at the main learning technology initiative actually dictates the devices that we um, have access to for 7th and 8th grade and then lump 6th grade in there too. So we can't really move away. Lenovo was not one of the choices in the MLPI program. It was either the HP 4440 laptop or it was the MacBook. So it's really going to sort of be dependent for the middle school group on whether or not, you know, MLPI offers other options. Um, at Wentworth, we opted to go with the 4440s because we got a good price on them. Um, and because, you know, it did create some consistency in terms of the peripherals that, you know, we used with them. We may in the future. I mean, I would think that would be fairly far down the road. I think by the time we, we say, okay, now we're going to make everything consistent, it's going to be something completely different that we have never seen before. If you think about even <coughs> two years ago when MLTI started looking at the laptops, you know, this was unheard of. I'm just trying to think in terms of synergies. I mean, I was leaning towards that in term, that model because across the district it's uniform, mm -hmm. um, and there are some synergies I think that we could gain. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I haven't briefly seen this, but I, I would like to see maybe a, a summary of bullet points um, of, of um, this choice and why. You know, a quick synopsis of costs, uh, infrastructure. I know it's laid out here price-wise, um, but maybe a little bit more of the methodology because this is honestly a new, a new spin for us now with this, with this product offering. So I, 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 if, there's, if we're losing something in the synergy, maybe we're not losing a lot, but I can see the perception out there being why are we going to a device that's not used at the middle school already and now we've got two different devices that we're working through. So a little bit more justification for that and a little bit more of an understanding of 
is that really an impact? Maybe it's not. If it isn't, why? And if it is, what, what factors overcame that for us? I think um, we need to sort of step away from the actual hardware casing when we think about consistency mm -hmm. and think about the back end management of it. So for us, what would be a really jolting experience to try to maintain would be if we had Mac and Windows. If we had two different operating systems, that would be really tough. And if you think about it from a software perspective, your software is not going to be compatible with both units. So as long as we stay with some type of Windows device, and what we like about this particular device, and we've already tested it on here, is that we can load a Windows 7 image. So even though it's touch screen, and even though it comes preloaded with 8.1 Pro, we can roll it back to a Windows 7 image so that all of our existing software is compatible with it. So that's kind of, that's the, the real cost of it. You know, if we buy a charger, we buy a charger. The, the real money is not necessarily in the chargers or sort of the peripheral pieces. A mouse is going to be compatible with anything that has a USB port. You know, so it's, it's sort of, that's not the big concern. The big concern is really what's the operating system, what's the versioning. So if we're not going to use, I mean, I understand with MLTI needing to be state-driven for 7th uh, and 8th, would we consider moving the rest of the district to that, the ones that we do have control over? Is that, is that the direction we're going to be going in? In the future, maybe, but I, I mean, I would look at Wentworth and I would say Wentworth is in year one of their laptops. They probably have another four years at least before we start to think about cycling them out. Mm -hmm. At that point, what's going to be on the market? Mm -hmm. Again, probably something that we haven't even thought of. You just mentioned that this machine actually going to come from the manufacturer with Windows 8 in on there? Well, we can order it with nothing on there, so that's what we, if you were to go out and buy this at Best Buy, you would buy it with Windows 8 1 Pro on it, right? Top screen, you know, the right. Windows yeah. Um, have you had experience to go back in, because I remember mine tried to go back to Windows 7, because yeah, I go to the drivers, and I made a video or audio that doesn't work because driver not compatible with Windows 7. Have you really tested with those in the scenario? Yep, we, we have two of these, and we've loaded Windows 7 on there. And, and all the drivers. Yep. I have I have a laptop and it has Windows. Uh, one of these larger, less expensive when I bought it. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, but I've had it I think three years, and they were just starting to come become popular. I think, and at Best Buy, mm -hmm. and I bought it because the salesman said, you know, it's it's really an IBM product. So when you so you're going to order it completely without the operation system and install all of the like over thousand by the your department, right? Mm -hmm. We image all the machines every year. Okay. All the machines have to be re-imaged every year because they come back to us, they're cleaned up. Um, you know, you don't know who's going to get that device the next year. So we buy the off. operation system directly from Microsoft with so many licenses? We actually buy it in volume through Actum, yeah, so we get a discounted price. Okay, so you can see in the budget that there's an initial outlay. The following years, um, it dips down because those are really sort of maintenance years. And one of the things that we've been talking about is really appropriating this fund um, where they should be, which is in the operating side of the budget. So until we start back into the cyclical, cyclical replacement of the machines, we will have um, those funds coming out of the operating budget just to basically maintain. Um, one of the things I do want to emphasize here is there will be some costs that will be offset by a um, maintenance program that we will have families pay into. This is the same that it is in Wentworth, it's the same that it is at the middle school. Families are used to having this kind of payment, it's very minimal but it does go into a fund that helps us to maintain the devices. Basically, um, small break fixes, um, things where if, if somebody actually loses a device, if um, the hard drive fails, you know, something that's not covered under warranty, which we actually do have a small number of cases of that. Um, as we roll forward with the fund, that, that money will be used to purchase some of the replacements in cycles where we don't have um, machines that are covered by ADP. When I say ADP, that's the accidental damage protection. Accidental damage protection, if you think about when you buy a car, 
and it comes with a basic warranty. Accidental damage protection is basically the bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty. It's not just your drivetrain warranty. This covers everything. So, for example, with the HPs, um, down at the middle school, we have ADP coverage, and that covers screen cracks. It covers um, liquid damage on your, um, on your keyboards. It covers drops. It can, anything that's accidental and not intentional damage. So we will purchase these with that kind of coverage for a period. You can see um, in the financial analysis and the modeling that I did, it um, will take you through the cyclical replacements, and it takes you through what that fund we estimate could look like. I mean, we're, so everything's an estimation. So just to let you know that there has been a significant amount of work done already um, to build the infrastructure at the high school, not necessarily in preparation of one-to-one. -one. A lot of these things were done in conjunction with other projects that we were doing. For example, when we replaced the telecom system town-wide, um, and some of them were just done because the wireless access points at the high school, there weren't enough of them, and many of them were failing. So this year we went in, we replaced all the access points. Um, we did beef up the, um, the infrastructure there when we were replacing the telecom system. There's increased bandwidth, which we did just district-wide a year ago. Um, we did buy and configure a systems management console. We did that when we deployed um, Wentworth, so this would actually just be part of that. And what that allows us to do is basically push out updates, um, push out uh, when we had online testing, we were able to remotely push out the um, secure browser for testing. So it allows us to manage these devices centrally. Um, and then we also set up all the students in the district on PaperCut, the, the central, centralized um, print solution that we talked about before. So all those students in high school are already in that program, in that database, and ready to go. And we did actually roll out six additional student printers at the high school. Again, not necessarily in preparation for this. There were other things going on, but the infrastructure is, is pretty much in place for this. In terms of implementation, again, there's a much more detailed implementation plan in, included in the proposal. But essentially, um, and this is really 40,000 foot high level, um, if this project were to be approved and to move forward, we would start um, in June or hopefully before assembling the actual image. This is what you were asking about, Jane the actual image that's going to go on the laptop. So one of the things the high school teachers, if you recall, um, emphasize they need are, is their specific um, software, customized software. Science department has probeware they use um, for different experiments and with different peripherals. So all of this software would have to be loaded into an image, and that image needs to be um, sort of nailed down before we actually move forward. Um, if, it, if, if the project is approved on July 1, we start purchasing the devices, we have to inventory them, we configure them, um, image them, test them, all this kind of stuff. That's going to take us through the summer because at the same time, we have 2,000 other laptops that we're doing for the rest of the district. Um, we will have parent meetings, and those um, parent meetings are pretty much the same meetings that we have for Wentworth parents, for middle school parents. We'll take people through the policy, the procedures, their responsibilities, accountability for the devices, and then sort of the um, escalation path for disciplinary action. Parents do sign off on it. We will get the payment into the maintenance program. Kids don't get the devices until that payment is made, and then we'll start deploying the, the laptops. When we do deployment of the laptops, we do go to every single classroom. We conduct training with the students. Again, it's all about responsibility, accountability, disciplinary action, um, and then we, and we train them on you know the basics of the device. Did you right now, the at the middle school, I know if I recall correctly, because it's been a few months since I wrote a check. Was it 25 or mm -hmm. okay? Will it be the same at? at the high school as well, or should it? That's the I mean, number I've built in to the maintenance program. Um, do you find that you need more than that to maintain? I mean, obviously now you're going from less than, a little less than 800 kids at 
the middle school up to having 1,200 or so at the... I'll be honest with you, okay, this is going to be a new model for us because when you look at Wentworth, we have grades three through five. They don't take the devices home. Right. Those devices stay there. Yep. So that payment's a little bit less. Yep. At the middle school, grade six doesn't take them home. Okay. Seven and eight take them home, but they're MLTI devices. We lease them from the state. So technically, we don't own them. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so we send them to a depot to be repaired, and there are costs associated with right. that, obviously, but um, it's not the full weight. So this is sort of going to be a new model for us in that we have four grades. They will take the, all take them home, yep. and we own these devices solely, and we're responsible for maintenance and repair. Well, and I'm looking at that flip piece mm -hmm. and just thinking about flipping it and just thinking about how many kids are not as, um, <coughs> I don't know, cautious about flipping it. And that's why we'll purchase them with the ADP protection right. because mm -hmm. that, that will help to buffer a lot of this cost during the time that it's covered. Under warranty. And then when you start to take a look at the replacement cycles, there are times when they, there's a portion of them that aren't covered. Mm -hmm. And that's when the maintenance program will kick in and we'll have to use some of that funding to actually replace some of the devices. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry, I was just suggesting about the, she was, uh, just picking back over here, is the cost you have here for your ADP is $139. Um, do you think, you know, are you imagining sophomore going to be three years, and a, so every year is going to be, you know, different, you know, for every grade it's going to be different. Is there something we can consider, you know, just the full cost of it, ask the parents to load it, to, to pay for it, because this is just the main, kind of the insurance part of the, you know, we still need the devices, but I hope, you, you know, that's something we can consider. Ask the parents to pay for the full cost of the ADP. The ADP. Yeah. I mean, essentially they will because what we've opted into in this particular model is the three-year ADP, which is 76. So over time, if you pay 25 a year, they do end up paying for that ADP and then a little bit extra at the end because the device won't be covered. You see what I mean? Because you're paying over four years at the high school. So, so and, and I kind of, I, I, I modeled this in many, many different ways trying to, you know, I mean, it was a, it was a balancing act of trying to make the number palatable, but at the same time, you know, give everybody sort of consistent accountability across the board. So this is kind of where it shook out. Could we change some of the numbers? We, we can. We can take a look at that again. I, I think we'll look at that in finance when we go through the whole proposal and see where the funding funding looks like and where we're coming from because there's, I mean, I get to take some time to look through this too, so yep. I'm sure we'll, we'll flesh those questions out in the, in the evaluation process, proposal evaluation process. I'm a, l a little bit less concerned about maintenance and accidents happening at the high school because they're high school students. They've used computers before, and now yeah. we're giving yeah. third graders yeah. laptops, and they're very respectful with them. I've seen kids using them. I don't really think that high school kids are going to not know their own hulking strength and rip the... Wishful thinking. I, <laughs> you have you have I, lovely eye really really coming up. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I've seen kids in all phase levels that have laptops right now using them, even small kids, and they know how to treat them respectfully. It's like we know how to treat books. They know how to treat computers. I mean, it's ingrained. Yeah, and that's interesting because as I reflect on being in classes all around the district, I've never once been in a class where I thought a kid was being reckless. Right, or with one was in device. danger. I never, either. you know, and I would, I would, as a parent, yeah. we have natural radar for that stuff. And I, I would be, you know, like there or saying, don't you think you should push this or move that? Never done that I, I, in, at any level. I actually overheard one day because I was volunteering at Wentworth and I heard um, Joanne Clive the first day she was in the room with the laptops in a classroom. I was in the hallway and I could hear her presentation to the kids. They already knew all the things because she asked the question. It wasn't just the here's what you'll do. You know, how would you walk down the hallway with this? And what would you do? And it was very specific even 
if you're in the stairwell, you'll have one hand on the railing and one hand on your bag. And that's the only time that you don't have a two-hand hold all the time. And that's the way they do it. If you see them, if you go in the classroom, so I'm, you know, they're starting it much very earlier. Cap- I'm very sure that our students are capable, especially with a similar age-appropriate rollout. Most of the know it is. We know how to hang hanging from my couch, going through a gym with them. Further in, I'm just saying. Yeah. Maybe they need to go to the Mr. Five and then. get that. They didn't start the third grade, so you know. Please refrain to dropping slide from sofa onto the floor and screen crack. So, but the thing is, I think. That doesn't affect the fact that we have to buy these insurance. No, we have to buy it. We have it, to right. pay for it. So if the parents can help out, then you know, we're very yeah. I, I think we'll, we can evaluate, because there is a balancing act between what we're going to provide and what we're expecting the parents to contribute, and I think we'll flesh that out. Um, just a quick question for the superintendent. What is the process for this proposal now? Are we going to be evaluating this and discussing this in the workshop session? Yes, yeah, this is the presentation. Essentially, you received the updates, mm-hmm. so the, this is really the, the the meat of the matter that you've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. Essentially, this is it. It now should be processed through uh, through finance uh, to whatever extent um, that we need to uh, schedule it into a workshop. We can do that as well. But this this, um, uh, should be, this is ready for consumption by the board. One quick question follow up with Monique's. Presentation. I did have a quick question on what was the difference, the descriptive difference between properly implemented one-to-one versus all one-to-one. What, how, how does that shape up? Is that subjective, objective, with their criteria? How does that work? Uh, the criteria within the findings within the report, for example, um, one of the findings was that um, in order to have an impact on student performance, that students need to use it daily. Um, another piece is that training is critical, um, and specifically in terms of having um, uh, principal of the school and other leaders of the school understand the importance of the support for the teachers, and clearly uh, David Creech does. Um, he's been um, working with the staff all this year at trying to support them in terms of finding the time for um, technology integration, and, that, and thus the reason for the technology integrator. So the findings are within the... Um, Appendix within that report, the project grad report within the proposal. Are they, and, and they are spelled out the difference? Mm-hmm. They are. Okay. Thank you. I just have a general question. I know that Auburn started with the kindergarten. I think they're now in the third year. Uh, do we have any data on on how that use of, of computers and pads has enhanced learning? Not from Auburn, we don't. Not from Auburn, okay. I mean, I, I, I don't. We could look and see if they have anything, but I, I have not seen anything. Okay, I'm just asking. I'm not looking yeah. for you to research it. I'm just asking if if it's there. Mm-hmm. At the MSMA conference um, two years ago, I went to mm-hmm. a presentation with the Auburn school district, and they showed, you know, it was basically a slideshow and presentation of how their kids use them, but there was not a lot of hard data that it was only maybe their second or third year. I think they've been doing it maybe three or four years now. I mean, I think it's a little further out. But, you know, the incredible stuff that the kids can do, I think it's valuable at every level, but definitely need it at high school. Yeah, the only research that I saw from the state, or most recent research, was from the um, uh, from the university, and it really talked about the Milty High School one-to-one program, um, and where not all high schools um, because of the cost, um, and we chose not to go with that program because of the cost associated. Um, but the research was really focused only on the difference between rolling out a laptop versus a netbook. Uh, and the consensus there was the, the laptop, given the functionality, and certainly for Scarborough, in terms of the functionality requirements, a laptop um, was a better um, value for the dollar. Uh, just review on the page eight. I, I don't see a breakout of the description of properly versus one to one, all one to one. It'd be nice to see that, especially if we're going to be quoting data out of the proposal, uh, so that I can, unless I'm missing it. What page did you say? Page eight. Oh, I thought it was somewhere else. Is it in there? If it's in there, then it's, uh, I have Page twenty-five. Later. Twenty-five. It is, yeah, like, um, yeah. has the um, documentation from the website. You've read the whole thing up there. Okay. <laughs> That's also a good website to uh, go and visit.
I think to the body, as you know, has been told, you know, we need, it's important to have the high school to have a one more step in the direction to go. It's, I guess, it's for me, at this point, is another question that comes down to how we pay for it. Uh, are we going to be, you know, from your knowledge, looking at, you know, I know I haven't seen the first budget, or further budget, um, do you suggest having vision check on other programs? Uh, no, we do. We have had a meeting uh, with uh, myself and Kate, and um, and the finance director for the town and the town manager, and so we have a general sense of uh, where this would fit, um, in in uh, in a very general what the description. Um, if uh, the majority of the cost would fit into CIP, there would be some small amount, uh, comparatively small amount, uh, carried in operations, and. Um, and it would require that CIP uh, be adjusted in order to be able to bring in a CIP budget proposal that is at the same level or less than it was last year. And that, um, has, that, that seems to be the direction that we would be going. Um, and, uh, and actually uh, pulling back on um, a fairly significant chunk of the facilities um, uh, requests that, that have been in there because we've taken care of many of the things, particularly those things that were safety oriented, for example, new vestibules for all of the new K2 schools, which was very pricey. So um, the short answer is the majority in CIP, but still not inflating the CIP budget, budget because we're able to really uh, reconcile that the expenditures and the work that has been done has really moved us uh, facilities-wise to where, where we need to be at this point. Um, so, uh, but that would be something that the Finance Committee would need to, to um, really just dig a little bit uh, deeper into. That's the, that's the general scenario that uh, seems to be uh, probably what would work best. Thank you. And as you can see, and again, Jen said, not in preparation necessarily for one to one at the high school, but in general preparation of advancing technology in the district, a lot of the a lot of the groundwork has been done so that other half a million or more dollars doesn't need to be added to this push um, to make this happen. It's already been it's already been expended. I just have one other question just looking at the the timeline. Um, if this was to be implemented this fall, the existing desktops at the high school, I see in quarter four 2015, those would go to the K2s. I, I guess that answers it right there. October, November, December. Yeah. Okay, so they wouldn't start the year with the desktops then at K2. Right. They would have to wait. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize is in the budget proposal, we are asking for a tech integrator at the high school. We are not asking to expand the IT staff at all. We are going to try to make do with the staff that we have. I reserve the right <laughs> to <laughs> ask in the future, but we're going to see how this works in terms of trying to roll everything out, which means that people are going to have to be patient in the other phase levels because we only have seven people and we have, this would give us, you know, over 3,000 laptops that would have to be imaged and cleaned up and rolled out, assigned to students. Um, you know, everything is done differently at different phase levels. So it's, it, and there's all these parent meetings and kid meetings and trainings that have to happen. So it's a huge project. It's all consuming for the entire fall when we do this already. So adding, you know, that much more um, volume to the process, it's not going to halt it, but we're just going to have to stagger things a little bit. But I think it is important to note that we we have a process, and we, as you pointed out in the Joint Finance Committee meeting, this is not new to us. We've we've rolled out programs like this before. It's just the volume that we're talking about mm -hmm. is going to is going to be a little bit challenging versus the we're not learning new processes necessarily or new plans. It's just doing it on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. And just one, one more follow-up on that. I know it's jumping many steps ahead, but 
the desktops that are currently at high school, I don't even know how many are there, but to be redeployed to K2s, would they go in a separate room and make it like a computer lab situation there? Or would they, because there's not a ton of room in the classroom to add that, more that, desktops. That was decided that, yeah. 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 That, we would do a needs assessment on that piece. I mean, replacing old ones, obviously, but. Yeah, it, 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 the. Uh, Yes, where they would go, um, and just also taking a look at the devices themselves, um, how old they are, um, whether or not they can run the software that's on the K2 images, all, all of that will need to be explored, um, but we certainly want to maximize and provide, um, and the K2s are, as you may know, next in line in terms of that refresh and that tech cycle, um, so we really need to take a look at what equipment is available, where we want to deploy it, and how. And yeah, and whether or not it can be deployed, because right, if it's yeah. a nine-year-old desktop, nobody's going to want that. And that brings up another question. What are we doing with the <coughs> obsolete equipment and the outdated stuff? Are we are we donating that? Or are we reselling it? Are we recycling it? What are, what's our... What's our, our first stop is Ruth's Reusables. Okay. Um, often, I mean often, like 90% of the time, they won't take it. Right. <laughs> it's actually too old. Right. It's too decrepit. You know, whatever. Yeah. Um, in that, I if that happens, then we do send it to a recycler. Yeah. I mean, what we we'll pull hard drives. We'll recycle the chassis. We'll, you know, depending on, on if if the hard drive has any confidential data, we'll shred the hard drive. You know, we go through all the regular processes. Okay. And then we'll send Mrs. Sizemore to every classroom and put the dumpster there and say, clean it up. <laughs> she does that very well. <laughs> wow. I have to say, though, Scarborough is really adept at redeploying things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where <laughs> it's... The, so we yeah, that. we yeah, redeploy yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but uh, that's where I think it's beneficial that we're a shared services department because we do sort of that, that retired um, hardware. Sometimes we find uses for it in other places that the school system might not have thought of or the municipal side might not have thought of. So I think you know, we, we get as much life as we possibly can out of these things. And pretty much when we're done with them, the only thing they're good for is to melt down into plastic lumps. Into plastic what? Lumps. That's a technical term. <laughs> very no wonder I didn't <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any other questions or comments? Okay. You staying all night? Or I move to, to adjourn. Second. <laughs> all in favor? Plus one.